Mac Tomlinson, it's really nice to have you here at uh, RHB, sitting by the fire. Thanks for dropping by the book sh uh, bookstore. Um, I wanted to talk to you about a book that you are publishing with us on the Brainerds. So not just David Brainerd, who we all know, uh, or many of us know, but um, the Brainerd brothers, and specifically his brother John. But first of all, I wanted to ask you a question in the in the dedication to your book, um, I saw the name of Ian Murray, so, and that just uh, was very interesting to me. So, could you tell me a bit about your relationship with Ian? Well, I met Ian in the in the early 1980s because I frequented the Banner Truth Ministers Conferences, and I just I just asked him so many questions, and and um, and providentially we just became friends. He uh, he encouraged me in the young days of the ministry, and he was always so kind. And so that began a correspondence somewhat. Of course, I proceeded to read, I guess, all of his books over the years. And then I would see him periodically at the Banner conferences again. And then in 1996, he came to the States, and he came to my church in Texas, to do a conference, and so the relationship became warmer, and um, and then I visited him in in Edinburgh mm -hmm. uh, about 14 years ago. So um, he became one of the primary influences in my life as far as church history and the combining of scholarship historically with theology and pastoral application mm. and so he had such an influence in me that I studied how he wrote biography and in writing some biography uh, he really under God humanly gets the credit and so that's why I dedicated my book on the Brainerds to Ian Murray. Mm. Ian's uh, biography of, of Edwards was had a huge impact on me during my own studies, uh, which were quite academic. But that book just, I think, was almost like a slap in the face, like, don't forget what you're doing this for. <laughs> was, was that book or some of his other books, um, especially because Edwards, as we know, had so much to do with the, the memory of, of David Brainerd uh, through his journals and, and whatnot. Um, was that some of the motivation behind your study of the Brainerds yourself? You mean Ian's books? Well, specifically, this is the work on oh, Edwards, Edwards and then the relationship to David Brainerd. Not so much the Edwards biography, um, though I read it and profited from it. I think originally it was just the journals of David Brainerd. Mm. Um, or so it it's so impactful to read that the sacrifice the courage that it took the providential heartbreak of David getting expelled from Yale and then God's providence unfolding mm. so just to read David's life and then his journals uh, just was very impactful mm. and then when I was in Edinburgh uh, 14 years ago I happened across in a in a uh, theological library, the life of John Brainerd, written by um, I think Daniel Brainerd, or it may have been I may be getting the the later Brainerd's name wrong, but I didn't know about John when I saw the title. I presumed it's probably related to David, yeah. and sure it was. So yeah. really, David's history compelled me to really learn more about John. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting because when I first saw the title of your book, I assumed it was about the Brainerd family in general. Um, then I was thinking, okay, this is maybe explaining more about who David was. But actually, your book is primarily about John Brainerd. I mean, of course, you set the context with the relationship between the two brothers, David and John. But could you, could you speak more about that relationship, about who, who were the Brainerds, um, but then who was, who was John Brainerd? Yeah. 
Right. Well, the the in the seventeenth century, the first Brainerd came on a ship from from uh, Britain and um, basically established, lived even as a a late teenager and then a young man lived near New Haven, Connecticut, and the Brainerd heritage began there. Mm -hmm. And so um, there were probably 20 Brainerds ultimately over 200 years that became ministers in New England and along the East Coast, New York. So David uh, and John were born into a family of Puritan stock and New England theology. Um, and John was two years younger than David. David went to Yale, as most of the Brainers did. It was kind of a family tradition that you did. Of course, Yale, and after that Princeton, uh, even to be a Presbyterian minister in New England, you had to attend Harvard or Yale um, or a European university. So, mm. um, so David enrolled at Yale and was there the first three years of his college time. And he became the class president in his junior year when Yale had the its largest class ever. Well, John followed him as a freshman two years behind him. And so in that junior year, David was expelled. And John, with sorrow, but grit and, and courage, stayed on and finished. So that's fascinating, this emphasis on scholarship, in a sense, for Presbyterian ministers at the time, which is an interesting background to these brothers given the fact that they chose to not go into academia or whatever you would call it at that time, or even just take a typ typical church. They, they went out into the mission field, right? Um, so what happened that, because I think what a lot of us don't realize, and I, I surely didn't realize until I read your book, is that, well, first of all, that there was a John Brainerd, and second of all, that John didn't simply follow in his brother's footsteps in Yale, but actually picked up the, the torch, as it were, um, at the untimely death of his, his older brother David. So what, what was the motivation behind that? What, what, what caused John himself to think, okay, this is my mission now. This is, this is my um, service to God to pick up where David left yeah. off. Well, um, John, when David was finally among the, the New England, in, well, not New England, the New York and Pennsylvania and New Jersey Indians, uh, he established three missions over three years. John went out to visit him at different times, and they were very close as brothers, spiritually very close. They were both men of of deep theology, deep maturity, godliness. And John was much like his brother. He just didn't become as famous. So the last year of David's life when he was getting more and more um, severe with his tuberculosis, um, David was facing that he was going to have to quit. And so the mission agency that had sent David was the Society for the Promotion of Christian Knowledge mm -hmm. out of Edinburgh, mm -hmm. but they had New York offices. Mm -hmm. So when David knew he was going to die, he recommended John to the society to replace him. Mm -hmm. And they interviewed him, they, they knew his reputation. Mm -hmm. So he was really chosen, handpicked by the society yeah. to be the replacement. So if, if David was that important to, or sorry, if John was that important to David, and if other people at the time recognized this, why have we forgotten about John these days? Why did he not become as famous? Well, David became famous because Jonathan Edwards published the journal. Yeah. He would have been forgotten too, mm -hmm. obviously. Mm -hmm. 
Um, John had a very brief journal, like 40 pages, and it was preserved in history, but never really uh, reprinted. Obviously, it's not large enough. And then Thomas Brainerd, a hundred year later descendant of John, wrote the full biography mm. on John. Mm. But it was reprinted in academic circles um, only. So he just was forgotten. There was never a popular work done on him to revive his, his legacy at all. Mm. Do you feel like your book is meeting that need in the sense that this is an individual that the church needs to hear about and know about, draw inspiration from? Are you hoping to fill that void that's been there for so long? Well, that's, that's right. That's why I wrote the book, because mm -hmm. the story was forgotten, needed to be told as a part of uh, 18th century American church history and missions in, uh, in the 18th century. So, right. Um, there, in all my research, there wasn't a lot. Uh, there wasn't as much as on, on John as David at all. So the material was, was a lesser amount but it was quality enough to tell the, the story. Mm. And so the story needs to be told. Yeah. Because John stayed 10 times longer among the Indians than David. David three years and John over 30 years. Wow. That's, that's amazing. I never even heard of John before your book. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I want to pick up on, you've mentioned a few times now, the Indians, and specifically it's the, the Delaware, is that correct? Uh, as one of the, the main groups that they were ministering to. <clears throat> but there were some challenges there, weren't, weren't there, uh, in approaching these people and trying to connect with them and, and minister the Word of God to them. Can you speak to some of what David and then, of course, John faced in that context? Yeah. Well, it's almost unbelievable because... Uh, Edwards called those areas a waste howling wilderness mm -hmm. and it was very dangerous. I mean, the, in, the Indians had been really taken advantage of by the white um, settlers and the, the businessmen who were, who were buying and selling and uh, so the Indian tribes, most of them already didn't trust white men at all. And so, and a lot of the tribes were really savages. They fought between each other. They were, there was a lot of drunkenness mm. and debauchery. And so it was a very dangerous thing for white men to travel alone in those areas. And John, David did for three years on his horse. Um, David rode his horse, they estimate six to 8,000 miles in three years between um, Long Island, New York, where he first started, and then the second Indian mission was at the Forks of the Delaware in Pennsylvania. The third and final one, which became most famous, was the Cross Weekson in New Jersey, mm -hmm. which was between Philadelphia and Princeton. So it was very, very dangerous. Yeah, so you, you actually dedicate a uh I believe a chapter of your book to the cross. Uh, I'm going to say it wrong. The Cross Weeks on Indian Mission. Right. Can you talk a bit more about about that mission? Yeah. Well, David, of course, he was prone to to chronic depression, and so that affected his how he viewed the mission. And in the first two missions in in Long Island and in Pennsylvania. He saw very little fruit as far as conversions. Mm. He did see God gave him favor with the Indians. He gave him, they trusted him because of his life and his example. But he didn't see many conversions. But he had real influence on reformation of their habits and their, taught them many things on, on farming. And uh, so I think he had far more impact than he thought but he didn't see a significant 
uh, turning of Indians to Christ in the first two years. Mm -hmm. When he went to Cross Weeks in the third and final year, he came there very discouraged. And he even records how he was at a low, low point of even having hope that God was going to do anything. And he was preaching under discouragement. And, um, and then he says, surprisingly, suddenly, at the very beginning, the very beginning weeks when he arrived, God suddenly began to create deep conviction and interest and openness among the whole tribe. Mm. And it became a significant work of God. Mm. And so I'm curious then, when, when John entered the picture, um, you know, at the blessing of SBCK, at David's recommendation, so after David's passing, was was John then stepping into a more favorable situation, or was he also then about to experience another, well, trials of his own for those next 30 years, or had David really kind of tilled that soil well for him? Oh, definitely David had prepared the way, no question. The Indians, of course, John had already met some of the Indians. I don't remember right now if he visited all three locations he very well may have but uh, John had favor from the beginning mm. when he came and the first place he went must have been to the forks of the Delaware in Pennsylvania and when the Indians knew he were, he was coming and they saw him they were just elated they welcomed him with open arms and they yeah. they already viewed him as a pastor Wow. so wow. yeah the way was really prepared mm. It's an incredible story to draw inspiration from for those today who are in ministry, missions, and it's, a, it's an interesting question, is it, um, am I, the pastor may ask, am I a David or a John? You know, if things are extremely difficult, maybe that, that man can take some some consolation in the fact that, well, maybe there's a John coming after me, <laughs> and maybe I'm suffering for the sake of that man's enduring ministry, which is simply by the providence of God. Yes. And it seems like that's one of these stories. There, now, there was another set of brothers 200 years earlier, um, correct? The, the Elliots. Um, John Elliot. Yes. <clears throat> forget the other one's name. I forget his brother's name too. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, everyone forgot John's name, so maybe someone will have to do a book on his, John Elliott's brother too, uh, or Jim Elliott's brother. Um, oh, are you talking about Jim Elliott? Jim Elliott, yeah. Well, he wasn't a brother of John. Jim was in the 20th century in, in Ecuador. Oh, right, in, right. In South America. Was it Ecuador? Ecuador? There was, there was, yeah. He was 20th century mission, martyr missionary. Yes, that's right. So not related, but except in the uh, the uh, spirit of being a missionary yes. in the gospel, right? Yes. So do we have other examples then from history of brothers or family members or those who have served um, that God has blessed in a special way for this type of quite challenging, even dangerous uh, ministry out in the field? I don't know of any brothers that actually labored together in history or one following the other. Um, I'm sure history would have those examples. Uh, now in the 20th century, Bert Elliott was laboring as a missionary in South America, Jim's older brother, though they were in two different countries. Mm. But, but it's similar to the Brainerds in that Jim uh, died soon after he went, and his brother Bert spent 62 years wow. Uh, wow. in South America. So they were close spiritually to one another, yeah. but the older outlived the younger with the Elliots. Oh, I see. With the Brainerds, the younger had much more longevity than the older. Yeah, yeah. What are some aspects of John Brainerd's ministry that you think have well, John himself has been neglected 
in terms of history and remembrance. And in your book, what are some aspects of of John's ministry, his character, uh, maybe even personal practices of his own spiritual disciplines that you really, really want to get across to the church today? What what should his enduring legacy be? Yeah. Well, I think John's godliness and his character mirrored David. Mm. Um, and when you really look at both of their lives, it's just incredible the kind of men they were, the fabric they were made out of. Of course, the times were hard, and it was hard to live in, in New England and in those, those um, colonial times, very hard. Mm. But if you think about a, a young white man going alone without a mission team into dangerous areas, living alone among Indians who didn't know you, who could have killed you any time, uh, and think how susceptible a man would be. Yeah. He builds a. David built three different log cabins. And he lived in those, so an India could Indian could have killed either of those men any day. And uh, so the character they had is the godliness first of all. The they were phenomenal preachers apparently I mean they would both preach and John more than David they would preach to large white congregations mm -hmm. and many would come to hear them uh, you read some of the sermons they're just really amazing mm -hmm. how quality how evangelistic how pastoral they are what good exegesis they have mm -hmm. so the ministry of both of them was a ministry of of um, apostolic bringing of the gospel to to heathens who worshipped ancestors and worshipped demons and uh, who had never heard of the living God. So it was apostolic in that sense. But as the Indians trusted him, they became pastors. Uh, both of them, they would visit the sick daily. They would um, they would travel on horseback and make circuits, and uh, they became trusted men of God. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, living alone, they suffered a lot of loneliness and um, deep depression sometimes. John wasn't near as prone to depression as David, but he had his bouts mm. of it. So just the fact that they could endure and stay at it year after year after year. They never were supported adequately ever. And both David and John uh, gave out of their meager resources. They supported young Indians to be trained in school. They established things to help the Indian's life out of their own meager resources. Um, in fact, governors in the 18th century into the 19th century and historians, some of which weren't even evangelical Christians, said the Brainerd Mission did more for the colonial Indians than anybody ever in early American history. And it's, it's because just the kind of men they were. Mm -hmm. Weaker men, less committed men, would have left and gone home. And some who came to work with John couldn't take it. Two, two young men, the Edwards, sent to work with John. One of them had a two week of a constitution. Another one's health failed. And so they, they couldn't last. So John, re John married, unlike David, and his wife was with him. He, his first wife died. He married again. So at least he had a wife. Yeah. And um, yeah. so. Did John have a, a children, a family? Yes. Okay. He had one daughter mm -hmm. from the first wife, and the second wife was a godly woman, 
and became a wonderful stepmother to the daughter. And yeah, yeah. so. Yeah. Um, we're, so John and David, of course, before him, but they faced a lot of challenges simply with, in that context of living with, ministering to, learning the language of, and on and on and on, the, the Indians who they were um, called to bring the gospel to. What about um, the settlers? What about the, the non-Indians? What was their response to what these kind of crazy young men were doing, going in and living amongst these people? It must have been quite odd for them to see that, yeah? Yes, and they had real opposition because many of the white people were traders and they would sell alcohol to the Indians mm -hmm. and they used them and abuse them, so they didn't like the brainers. And they would spread all kind of rumors to the Indians. Wow. These men are charlatans or they're dangerous, but the Indians ultimately never bought it because they saw the lives yeah. and the sacrifice and the love the brainers had. John later, he established, he actually planted churches among uh, white settlements okay. and, and gained real in, inroads among um, white people, Scottish, Welsh, uh, other Euro Europeans that came and settled. So they had real gospel influence among the whites as well. What do you think it was then about John and David? Um, I'm thinking even more so about John though because of the endurance of his, his ministry. I mean, 30 years in that kind of a context is a very long time, yeah, especially in today's context where if you see the numbers, there's so many men leading the pastorate and um, for whatever reason. So what was it about John that maybe in his background, his upbringing, was it simply his constitution? What was it about him that, that enabled him to, to endure for so long? Well, some of those things are possibly indefinable, you know, they're, they're not, um, tangibles that you can even define. Uh, the character was deep in the Brainerd legacy. Mm -hmm. um, the, the maturity, the, the high standards of integrity and faithfulness and commitment. Um, they were men of conscience and conviction. Yeah. Uh, John, he didn't have the health battles or the depression that David had, okay. which enabled him yeah. to persevere. John was given favor by God with the governors of the colonies, and they really liked him. And at times they would support him. And then of course, um, this would fit here to mention, when David was expelled from Yale, Edwards and many of the Yale alumni, which were then New England pastors and pastors around the colonies, were just enraged mm -hmm. that David was expelled mm -hmm. wrongly, uh, roughly. In fact, John Wesley said when he heard the news, he had read David Brainerd's journal. And he said, can those people even be Christians? Wow. <laughs> and so it, the, um, Yale was very vilified among the evangelical world after that. And so it was Yale alumni who said, we must start another college. And they started Princeton. Because of what happened to because David. Because of what happened to David. So, uh, and then Princeton, later John became a trustee of Princeton. So John he, Brainerd. He did. He became okay. he became very influential in the colonies. A man of stature, a man of uh, reputation, and he was offered large pastorates in places like Philadelphia or some of those cities, and he always declined. Because he wanted to stay amongst the Indians. Yeah. So he he felt as called by God to the Indians as much as his brother ever had. 
it wasn't just staying because it was David's work. What about John and David's extended family? What, what was their perception of these two brothers? Well, they had sisters that were believers. Uh, one sister was named Jerusha, Jerusha Brainerd. And of course, David became very close friends with Jerusha Edwards. She became a nurse and a close friend the last months of his life. Um, there's not a lot known about his siblings. They had a great heritage, a godly heritage, and their parents were godly, and they they read wonderful books, Puritan books, and and uh, growing up in the home, so they cut their teeth on godliness, and so I think it ran through the family generally. Mm. I'm curious to know that in the course of writing this book, what impact it's had on your own spiritual life, your own individual walk with the Lord, but also your, your ministry in various capacities to your family, to church, and so forth. What, what has, well, I'm asking this question because I want others to think, okay, I want to read that book as well to get that benefit. So what has this, what has this done for you, Mac? Well, researching the writing of the book made me feel greatly ashamed. Oh, wow. I said, I'm not even worthy to address the lives of these men. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like I'm a, a spoiled, soft American that has never suffered for the gospel. So it really humbled me. Um, and yet inspired me to labor more to be more faithful, to persevere when I don't feel well physically. I mean, I've been through four major surgeries, mm -hmm. and um, it just inspired me to persevere and keep on and be faithful. And even their pastoral example of loving the needy, loving the weak, um, and being so faithful to go into Indian villages and stay there two weeks, three weeks, and go from wigwam to wigwam and do what Paul did in Acts 20 from house to house. Yeah. They loved the people in the moment. They cared about them. Uh, it's made me want to be a, a more faithful pastor, for sure, their example. Mm. Mm. Would you say that Oh, I can add one other thing Go too. For it. Our church is very involved in missions mm -hmm. in South America, Eastern Europe, Alaska, uh, Lebanon, Jordan, and I th not through me, our church got an increased burden, but I did get an increased burden, and our church be has become more mission-minded, more actively involved to just take the gospel forth. So mm. I think maybe some of that has rubbed off in our own church ministry. So, and how long did it take you to write this book or the, the process of research to writing? How long have you been working on the book? The timeline. Uh, what I'm trying to get at is at what point did that spark kind of go off and you thought, I need to start telling my people about this yeah. and, and inspiring them and in a sense calling them, of course the Lord calling them, to the mission field to get out there. Yeah. Yeah. I think I went to, to Scotland 14 years ago, give or take a year. That's where I read the life of John Brainerd mm -hmm. while I was there. Mm -hmm. Within the next year, I wrote an article on John Brainerd's life for the Banner of Truth magazine. Mm -hmm. It's called The Forgotten, well, The Forgotten Brainerd. I wrote another article on him this year. They wanted another one, uh, which was a s material out of the book now. And so, uh, but it was somewhere in between, maybe six years ago. I said, 
you know, this story's got it needs to be told. And nobody's done it. There's men far greater than I could do it, but they're not. So I kind of felt like I should. So I would say five or six years part time in the ministry in the midst of ministry and yeah. travel and pastoring. So Yeah. Let me grab just a few more questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll just ask you two more questions, Mac. Hey, how are you doing? Fine. Okay. Me too. It's a great conversation. Um, I'm very curious to hear about John Brainerd's uh, theology, but really, I guess the way that you put it is, you know, his doctrine. So doctrine was a very important part of um, what John was doing and the impact he was able to have. Can you speak about that, the, the significance of doctrine for, for John's ministry? Yeah, well, as I said earlier, both David and John were, were, were rooted in uh, the old New England theology, the Westminster standards, etc. Um, and so they were, they were true theologians, uh, pastorally. Um, and they would catechize the Indians on the shorter catechism. Mm -hmm. uh, and they would teach as well as preach. The preaching was usually evangelistic. But, of course, in each place, David had established a church. Um, and there was one period where a, one Indian tribe, the... the um, a, a rich white man uh, counterfeited the land deed to the Indian's property and it was taken from him by this rich white man, a politician. And soon after that, that man fell dead on a dance floor. But the, the damage was done, the Indians had to move. So David directed them to go to another mission. Um, I'm trying, John Sargent okay. was 20 miles from one of the, the Indian missions that the Brainerds had. So that Indian tribe with the Brainerds, they moved to where Sargent was and they, they became a church with that group. So these were Indian churches and so they were taught the Westminster Standards. Um, they were taught just full-orbed evangelical Calvinism, but with a, with a godliness, with a spirit of prayer and missions and different Indians uh, among those, those tribes went into ministry at the expense mm -hmm. of the Brainerd Brothers. Um, See, that was actually my next question because okay. we've been talking a lot about the, the work and the ministry of John, of course, of David as well, but just this long 30 years of putting all this effort and time and traveling all around on horseback, thousands of miles. And this whole time I've been thinking, well, what about the Indians? Like, what happened with them? And what was the enduring legacy of the Indians? And were some of those men uh, called forth to the ministry as Indians? Can you speak about what was happening amongst the tribes and the people that that did, uh, that John was was right. Reaching. There wasn't much left on information on those Indian preachers. There was one, and I wish I could retrieve the name that I mentioned the most toward the end of the book. Um, Edwards recommended to John Brainerd that John and this Indian. I think his last name was Oakum, mm -hmm. O C C U M. Okay. And to go to England and take a tour to raise money for the Indian missions and for the education, theological education of Indian young men, which they did. De, uh, John didn't go. 
So I forget which American went with him. I'm sorry about that. But Oakham went, and it was a huge success. Um, I think he was there two or three months, was welcomed, um, and um, and so I think, if I remember right, he was Princeton trained by then, and he pastored and had real influence as an evangelist and a pastor among Indian tribes. After John passed, the Revolutionary War also this scattered some of the Indians, mm -hmm. and uh, ultimately, many of them uh, migrated to Canada, the Dakotas, I think, uh, to Michigan. Uh, and so, the the legacy is not that Indian work is not in those places anymore. Two hundred years later, mm. and so there hasn't. Just to reiterate what you said. There hasn't really been much written about the, the legacy of specifically the Indians and those Indian ministers after the time of, of John Brainerd. I don't think there's much. They're no. not. I may be wrong, but I don't think there's a lot mm -hmm. that was ever preserved about them. That's a shame. Yeah. It'd be a fascinating history. I think. The legacy that's preserved is the, the phen phenomenal thing that God did among, by the Brainerd brothers for the, all those Indian tribes in the colonies. Uh, it's, it's just really unbelievable what they did for them. Yeah. Not just in taking the gospel, but in teaching them how to live in, in a society that really opposed them. Mm -hmm. And that year by year was pushing them out, essentially making them disappear almost. Right. Now, as far as education, John Brainerd, with help, established an Indian boys' school that became a college that was later moved and became Dartmouth. Really? Yeah, so this is okay. big, big ripple effects. Okay. Yeah. What a fascinating history. This, it is. this is a very, very important part of American history. We, we, we've talked about Yale and Princeton, how Princeton came about, and then now Dartmouth, and all of this in this kind of, correct me if I'm wrong, but this post Great Awakening mm -hmm. period. And these two, just these only two men, one for a short flash in the pan, mm -hmm. and the other for that extended slow burn. You had such a powerful impact, and I, I, I just wish we knew more about those those Indians, not just the ministers he trained up, but those families and those children and young Indian children being catechized the Westminster Shorter Catechism. It's fascinating. Yeah. And was this done in English or in their in their, in their dialect? Okay. The Brainerds worked with translators, but John. Of course, there were different Indian dialects among different tribes they were among, so they usually had to use a translator. But I think John ended up being able to preach in some of the dialects. <laughs> yeah. It really does put us all to shame, doesn't it? Does. It does. Yeah. Yeah. What, this is my last question for you, what is the, if you could dial it down to one thing that you want a reader, the readers of your book, to, to walk away with, to just be branded in their heart when they read your book on on, on John Brainerd. What is what is that one thing that you want them to walk away with? I think the single th biggest thing that marked the Brainerds was courage mm -hmm. to endure in ministry mm -hmm. and never stop. Um, you know, some would say they were unwise to go alone. But that's why the SBCK did it in those days. Um, and so the courage that they had to endure, persevere, for the, just for the gospel, um, is my one hope that the book will speak to. Well, speaking for myself and probably others, I'm very excited to, uh, 
to see the impact your book's going to have. So thanks for sitting down with me to talk about John Brainerd, and I appreciate you coming here, Matt. Thank you very much. It's yeah. my pleasure. All right. I appreciate you. it.